Good afternoon, everyone. It is Friday, October the 9th, and it is noon central time, which means it is time for another novel coronavirus update for clinicians. Uh, it's good to have you here, and uh, I'm glad that you keep coming back to these and, and find them um, helpful and informational. Um, if you would please go to uh, menti.com on your device and enter the code 4253517. That's 4253517. Uh, we have just a few polling questions that we like to uh, do each time that we have one of these webinars just to make sure that we know who our audience is and that you're still finding these helpful and the kinds of topics that you would like us to discuss um, the next time that we come back. So um, with that, we'll get going. So. Um, the first question this morning, what frustrates you the most about this pandemic? Um, and uh, lots of answers about anti-maskers and <laughs> crazy, no leadership, um, no end. Yeah, it definitely feels like that. And um, we're gonna talk about that in a few minutes too. Um, uncontrollable, uh, anti-maskers, all, all of that. Um, We'd like to know who you are, so if you'd take a minute um, to just tell us what kind of um, profession you represent, we'd appreciate that. And uh, if you have been to these webinars before, we always like to know that as well. Oh, there's a couple of new people, that's great. Uh, so welcome to you guys. Uh, we usually end up with some pretty good numbers by the end of this, um, and uh, so we'll, we'll keep uh, the mentee number up at the end of the presentation for anybody who missed it so that you can jump in. And then we also like to know how y'all are feeling. Um, and we've actually followed this metric through the course of the pandemic ever since uh, April when uh, we started doing these webinars and we've seen the shift. Um, it's nice to see that we might be getting a little shift back to the left at this point, which uh, would be really nice because we lost all of the I'm goods and most of the it's manageables um, oh, around June and July. Uh, so maybe we're starting to uh, have a little resiliency among us, um, but it's always good to, to keep uh, a thumb on what's going on out there too. So I'm Dr. Michelle Siskus. I'm the medical director of the Vaccine Preventable Diseases and Immunization Program here at Tennessee Department of Health. And six feet to my right is Dr. Kara Levinson, who joins us frequently. She is the deputy director of the Division of Laboratory Services over at um, the State Public Health Lab. And she's gonna be talking about some updates and testing information at the end of this. Um, but first, as we usually do, we're gonna update some of the stats for you. So um, the, the next several slides are gonna be all doom and gloom, unfortunately, um, because no one is going in the right direction. Um, the, the world has taken on another 6.3 million cases uh, just in the last three weeks since we last spoke um, and had, uh, what is that, almost 100,000, over 100,000 deaths in the last three weeks. And that epi curve had started to slow and plateau around August and now we can see that there's a, a steady uptick now over the last uh, month plus since probably the end of August, early September. So those bars all represent daily counts of, um, of cases. So about 350,000 new cases every single day uh, on, in the world right now. Um, this is how some of the other countries are doing in comparison to uh, the United States. So the US is the orange by humped line that, uh, that has the highest hump on the left side. Um, the, the redder one that's a little bit below US, that is um, Brazil that came on really strongly and actually passed the United States in cases in June, but has now gotten control of their outbreak and, and has started to consistently but slowly come down. Um, India is the green line and that shot up like a rocket, but has also really started to have some um, precipitous decline in their numbers. And then the cluster at the bottom there represents the United Kingdom and France and Spain, um, all of which are seeing some new rise in cases, uh, which is really concerning as we see most of um, Europe coming into uh, a second or in some cases what might be a third wave of, of this virus. So um, this is what Italy is doing right now. So they had a big first wave, now they're coming up 
Germany is doing something similar. Indonesia is in their first outbreak there, um, but their numbers might be starting to track down. The Netherlands has come up, and you can see their case counts are way higher than their initial wave of this back in the spring. Uh, same for Spain. This, this uh, curve now is much higher than their initial. The same for France. Argentina uh, has its first wave, which is uh, pretty significant. Uh, the United Kingdom is in a vertical climb right now with their case counts. Um, and then I just want to show you India versus the United States. So India's population is 1.37 billion. The United States population is 0.3 billion. And you can see that our case counts are actually not all that far off of India. And we have had this ongoing sustained transmission where uh, India looks like it's going to go up and come back down. If you look at the case counts, so India has reported 6.7 million cases. The U.S. has had 7.5 million cases uh, with about a fourth of the population. And our deaths are double what they've had in India. Um, now, there may be some reporting issues with the data coming out of India. Um, that's, you know, po a possibility. But if not, um, this, this is really amazing that a country uh, that is impoverished and has four times the population of the United States has come out of this pandemic, um, and we have not. In the United States, uh, we had also started to do a little bit better and now are starting to climb back up again. We actually have higher numbers now um, than we've had since before August. Um, so the, the gains that we made over September have, have now started to vanish. Um, we have had an additional uh, 700, no, an additional, I can't math today, an additional 700,000 uh, confirmed cases. Um, all of those deaths, what is that, 40, 30,000, almost 30,000 deaths. Um, just in three weeks in the United States. So that's the death curve on the bottom right. So we're still seeing smaller numbers of deaths than what we did at the beginning, and that is because the science has evolved. Um, we have some um, medications that can be used. We, we know to prone people and take other measures to try to get them better faster, um, to try to keep them off ventilators that they tend to not come off of very well. Um, but the case counts are continuing to, um, to spike back up. So um, again, looking at the comparisons between the flu pandemics that we've had and the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, we have now passed uh, global deaths for um, the H3N2 in 1968 and the 2009 H1N1. And probably by next week, we will have passed global deaths for the 1957 H2N2 avian flu, making this the world's most deadly pandemic uh, since the 1918 avian flu. And then uh, the U.S. deaths have well surpassed, uh, almost doubled, uh, what any of these pandemics have, um, have provided to us. So hopefully we won't ever get to the 670,000 deaths that were seen uh, in 1918-era healthcare, but uh, we're certainly not slowing down at this point, and we're eight and a half months in. As far as the states go, so this is looking at all of the states um, back in July, and so the, the states that are pinker or red uh, we're having more trouble. You can see their epi curves there uh, underneath the states. The ones that were green were actually moving in a really good direction. The ones that were white were, were sort of stable. Um, so this was July. August, we really started to get some nice numbers and some, um, some you know, really good looking state epi curves. And then uh, September 2nd uh, and September 16th, and October the 7th. And so um, we as a nation are moving in the wrong direction. We have this uptick in epi curves in many of the states um, across the country at this point. So uh, we started here at TDH, uh, um, put up our incident command system on January 15th, well in advance of any cases in the state of Tennessee that we didn't start seeing until March. Um, we've been in this uh, system for 268 days, and uh, we have had 218 days since our first case of COVID-19 in the state of Tennessee. Our data is published every day at 2 o'clock at tn.gov health. 
Um, you can see that our case numbers, uh, daily case numbers are up since uh, from where they were three weeks ago. And we've had this sustained bump in daily case numbers um, and, and 30,000 new cases in three weeks. Um, 30,000 new cases is one fifth of all of the cases that we've had through the pandemic. And that has happened in the last three weeks of this pandemic. Um, our deaths are up significantly, um, 550 deaths in three weeks. Um, we um, continue to, to see some increase in our hospitalizations. We had had some good numbers uh, through September, and uh, actually got our daily hospital counts down to about 700 and some. Now we're back over 900 again. Um, and we continue to do a, a lot of testing with um, 3 million tests. Um, our case, our, our test positivity rate has also gone up by over a percent from September 17th to now. And so that is also moving in the wrong direction. The goal is to get that under five. We got darn close three weeks ago, but now we're um, coming up closer to 7%. This is what the Tennessee curve has looked like. So uh, we had this um, big jump that happened uh, right after the 4th of July, and then some mask mandates were put into place. We started to see some improvement. And now we've been stuck, if not actually upticking a little bit here over the last few weeks. And this is uh, what our Tennessee deaths have done. So we have not seen the improvement in death rates that uh, have been seen uh, across the country, um, or I should say case fatality rates. Um, we continue to have um, some high numbers of deaths across the state um, each day that uh, is far surpassing what we were seeing earlier um, in the, or really at any point during the pandemic. Our case fatality rate is up a little bit. It's at 1.3%. Uh, it was at 1.2% three weeks ago. Our um, case fatality rate in those who are over the age of 60 is also up at 6.5%. And our deaths in long-term care facilities are also up at 14.4%. So if you are in a long-term care facility and become infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, there's a 14% chance that, that you um, will have a, a fatal infection. Um, case numbers in youth uh, are holding steady at about 18% of all of the cases, um, but we are continuing to hear about large clusters in school systems and on college campuses that um, continue to, to be very worrisome as well. Huh. Okay, so <laughs> that was all a lot of really terrible information, um, and you know there have been times when we've been able to sit here on these webinars and give good numbers that were cautiously optimistic. I'd used the word cautiously optimistic several times during this webinar, and uh, there, is, there just isn't any today. So uh, we're going to talk about vaccines because it's looking like that's going to be the thing that we're going to be relying on to get um, Tennessee and the nation and the world back to where it needs to be. So just a reminder about vaccine development. So um, you can see in the green arrows, the phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. And I think the thing to stress here, especially for those of you who are providers who might have um, patients that are concerned about the rapidity of which uh, vaccine is being developed, there is no condensing of the timelines in these clinical trials. So there may be a clinical trial that starts in phase one that quickly starts in phase two and maybe overlaps with phase three a little bit, but the length of those individual trials is still the same length that it usually is. Where we're hearing about um, you know, kind of warp speed development is because the, the federal government has um, bolused funding to the, the seven or so manufacturers who are um, developing vaccines so that they can go ahead and start producing that vaccine now while we're waiting for the outcomes of the clinical trials. So typically what would happen is you have phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials, they get the data back, they decide that a vaccine's gonna be gonna work, and then they start manufacturing millions and millions of doses of it to be able to get it out. What's happening is that they're manufacturing the millions and millions and millions of doses now while we're waiting for the data so that um, they can deploy that vaccine as soon as they get the, the go, no go uh, decision on phase three clinical trials. And that means that the government stands to lose uh, billions of dollars that have been 
put into um, the, the industry to be able to produce these vaccines, and that's a risk that they were willing to, date, to take to try to get um, the vaccines developed and, and put out as quickly as possible. But um, there should be you know, assurance that the vaccine that gets approved will be one that has gone through all of the appropriate phases of study, is going to be, continue to be um, actively monitored and is going to be safe and, and meet certain efficacy standards before it's going to be deployed. So um, yesterday, uh, I actually saw a webinar that was done by WebMD, not my favorite place, but they had um, Director Han from the FDA on, and so I listened to it. Um, and uh, what he has promised is, and this is from the mouth of Director Han, is that vaccines will have to have at least one robust clinical trial. So all of these vaccines are required to enroll at least 30,000 participants that the vaccine will have to have at least 50% efficacy, which means that there have to be um, one, at least uh, less than one half the number of people who become infected with the virus from receiving vaccine versus placebo. There has to be follow-up data for a minimum of two months from the last dose that was provided to at least 50% of the study participants, and there has to be active post-marketing assessment. Um, and so you know, one thing to remember is that the people who enrolled in the, in the small phase one, phase two clinical trials, um, they got this vaccine months and months ago now, and so they don't forget about those folks and stop monitoring them. They continue to monitor them for um, any kind of long-lasting um, impacts. And so we will have data on these vaccines from the phase one clinical trials um, for months and months before we ever get a vaccine that ends up out the door. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the four different kinds of vaccines that are being produced right now because some of them have really cool um, and interesting technology. So there are mRNA vaccines, and so these are messenger RNA vaccines. And messenger RNA is, is kind of the recipe for um, how to make a protein. And so what happens with these, these are, these are not vaccines that, uh, this is not a way to produce vaccines that's been done before, um, but it's pretty exciting technology. So they take the recipe um, for the, the, the protein, the spike protein on the virus, and they put it into a little delivery vehicle, like a little um, lipoprotein capsule, and it gets injected and goes into the cells and gets taken up there. And then that little recipe is um, translated by the, the human cells to make the protein, the spike protein. And then that spike protein gets um, presented to the immune system, and that's how the antibody is made, because that protein is seen as being foreign. Um, these are pretty cool vaccines. One of the benefits is that they're, they're apparently really easy to produce and able to produce pretty quickly. Um, so there are two vaccines that have had, um, that, that are, are in Operation Warp Speed development right now. One is the Moderna vaccine, which has had a lot of press. Um, that is a two-dose vaccine regimen with four weeks between the doses, and it requires frozen storage, um, just as we've stored MMR vaccine. And um, there has been a little slowing of their ability to get this vaccine um, through clinical trials. So they are anticipating that it would not be ready for public use until probably early quarter two of 2021. The second of these mRNA vaccines is one from Pfizer and BioNTech. Um, this is also a two-dose vaccine, but there's only three weeks between those doses, so they've moved ahead a little more quickly in clinical trials than the Moderna vaccine. Um, it requires ultra-cold storage to minus 70 degrees Celsius, which is a problem because that means that this vaccine has to be stored on dry ice um, if, if for facilities that don't have ultra-low storage. And it's also um, just difficult to be able to um, be nimble with the use of that vaccine. So we'll end up using it in hospitals and in mass vaccination events, but it's not something that's going to be able to be shipped very readily to, say, a clinic on the corner or a local pharmacy. Um, they anticipate this one might be ready for public use in early 2021. The second type of vaccine that is in development are called replication defective viral vector vaccines, which is a mouthful. Um, and this is very similar to the way some other vaccines have been used in the past. So what happens is they take um, a viral vector, so they take um, the genetic material of a virus, and that virus is um, 
is messed up to the point that it can't make copies of itself. So it has no ability to infect people. And they put the recipe for that protein into the genetic material of this vector. They give that as a vaccine. And then that, uh, that viral vector is able to enter a human cell, um, drop off the payload of the, the recipe for the, the protein. Uh, and then just like in the, the previous vaccine we just discussed, the cells then make the protein and then present that to the immune system and, um, and it makes uh, antibodies to the protein that's found on the surface of the virus. Um, the, there are two of these right now. One is using a, chim a chimpanzee viral vector, um, and that's an AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine is one that, uh, oh, I guess maybe a month ago now, had one report of a patient who was in the study who developed transverse myelitis. Um, they have, uh, they determined that it, it was not caused from the vaccine, and they've restarted the international studies on this, but the United States has not resumed its trials yet. Um, so that's gonna push this vaccine out some. Um, and that might sound really concerning, but I think it's really important to understand that that means this process works, and it's doing what it's supposed to do to catch one person out of all of the people who have been vaccinated who may have had an adverse event that might be related to this and thoroughly investigate it before anything moves forward. The second vaccine uh, in phase three right now is the Jan Johnson & Johnson or Janssen Pharmaceuticals vaccine. This is an adenovector vaccine. Adeno, uh, adenovirus is a cause of the common cold. So one of the challenges with this is that um, when you give this vector to a human, if they have tons of antibodies circulating to that particular virus, it destroys the, the vector before it has a chance to go drop its payload off and, and um, make the protein. So they have to identify viral vectors where there's not a lot of human antibodies circulating in order for that vac vaccine to be effective, and, and that's why um, there can sometimes be challenges with the development of these and efficacy of these vaccines. Um, and that's why AstraZeneca chose the chimp virus because um, there aren't human antibodies to that. The third type of vaccine that's in development is an adjuvanted protein subunit vaccine. This is very similar to what we see with like the flu vaccine. Um, so all they're doing is taking the protein instead of the, the human making the protein in its own cells, they're actually taking the purified protein and injecting that and presenting that to the body to create an immune response. Novavax um, is a two-dose vaccine that is this type of vaccine. It's refrigerated. They are spending a lot of time enrolling people who are over the age of 65, which is great, um, but they were just dropped from Operation Warp Speed funding, so that may also slow Novavax's ability to get um, a vaccine out. And then Sanofi um, and GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, have partnered to also create a subunit vaccine. Uh, it is not yet in phase three clinical trials, and, and I haven't actually seen a whole lot of information about that one yet, but it's expected to be one of the laggers that, that might be available sometime later in 2021. And then the fourth type of vaccine is a DNA vaccine. These are very highly effective vaccines. Um, but they're kind of difficult to make. So Inovio has one. Um, it had a phase two, phase three combination study um, or trial that was being done, but it has been halted because of concerns over the inject in injection device. So this vaccine um, was to be delivered via a needleless system where it was a high, high uh, air pressure jet gun that was used to deliver the vaccine under the skin. Um, apparently FDA has had some um, concerns about that device, so this has been halted for right now. Um, so uh, we may see this one come back once their device gets cleared by FDA, but, um, but it's, uh, it's on hold for right now. Um, the nice thing about DNA virus vaccines or DNA vaccines is that they trigger both types of immunity, so B cell immunity and T cell immunity, which means that it can be a more robust immune response that lasts longer. Um, but again, these vaccines take longer to develop. So each one of these types of, of platforms has pros and cons to it. 
Um, we are in the process uh, here at the state of developing the state's COVID-19 vaccination plan. And um, this is uh, largely informed by the framework for equitable allocation of COVID-19 vaccine that came out last Friday from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, we also have a CDC playbook that we, um, that we look to and, um, and also have formed a very robust stakeholder group that we meet with every two weeks to um, bounce ideas off of and get their feedback around uh, what this vaccination plan should look like. So um, that lives here in, in my office um, at the Department of Health and the Vaccine Preventable Diseases and Immunizations Program. And this um, plan for the state is due on October the 16th, which is next Friday. So we are um, busily writing this plan. And um, once that's submitted, we'll be able to share uh, some more details about what vaccination planning might look like in Tennessee. Uh, this is a list of the stakeholders that we've engaged in um, in these discussions. So we have everything from um, the Office of Disparities and Elimination here, uh, Disparities Elimination here at TDH, to the medical societies, to legislators, um, the, the Department of Education, TenCare, um, the Commission on Aging and Disabilities, um, all sorts of um, different places and different stakeholders representing different populations that need to be considered when we're looking at creating a plan like this. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is uh, it is October, and as we pediatricians like to say, flu before boo. So um, right now the, the map is pretty quiet. I don't know what's happening up there in Wyoming that they apparently missed a data uh, dump or something last week, but this is the um, influenza-like surveillance report that comes out every Friday, I think, for the week prior. Um, the country is pretty quiet except for Puerto Rico that's been kind of churning along for a little while now. Um, but uh, it takes about two weeks for that injected flu vaccine to start to work. So you don't want to wait too long before you go out and get that flu mist, which is the uh, live attenuated virus vaccine, works in about two days. So if you're uh, under the age of 50 and above the age of two, that might be a good option for you if you're otherwise healthy. Works a little faster, um, but also a little harder to find. Most of the local pharmacies don't stock flu mist. They just have the injected version. And then um, Fight Flu TN uh, is happening on November the 19th, which is a Tuesday and just a little over a month. Um, this is a yearly uh, exercise that we put on as the state with our emergency preparedness program and our community health center or our um, community health services, all of the local health departments and the metro health departments, where we stand up vaccination sites on one day and practice how we give vaccine to lots and lots of people. Um, so this year we'll be using the drive-through um, testing sites that are set up all over the state. Those on November 19th will become flu immunization sites uh, so that we can practice using things like the mass immunization module and tennis to record these vaccine doses, work on traffic control, um, work on public messaging and all that, and just be able to manage uh, socially distanced immunizations uh, to large numbers of people. So watch for that on November 19th. We'd encourage you to go get a flu vaccine before then, but if you don't, then um, you might want to stop by one of these areas um, and, and get one that day. Uh, and then finally, on Thursday next week, we will be having uh, a What's New with the Flu webinar where uh, we'll talk about the, um, the recent international, national, and statewide um, flu seasons talk about our Sentinel surveillance network and how um, providers can participate in that, talk about flu vaccine, uh, that Fight Flu TN event, and our new media campaign uh, and resources um, uh, that are available to you to help uh, publicize about the need to get flu vaccines in your community. So with that, we will turn to LabGab and Dr. Great. Carol Levinson who is going to talk about a bunch of labby stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Completely um, shift gears here. Drop some knowledge. Yeah. I never thought molecular biology would be the most optimistic part of the <laughs> webinar, but here we are. I think we're there. Um, so I'll take it. So uh, today I'm going to talk about cycle thresholds or CT values and their relation to COVID-19. This is mainly for molecular diagnostic tests for COVID, specifically PCR. Um, because we've gotten a ton of questions about it in the last couple of weeks. I know it's been in the news. 
um, and there's lots of ongoing studies looking at CT values and how they rate, relate to COVID-19 and whether or not they're an indicator of infectiousness. They're a way to, you know, weasel out false positives potentially. So lots of questions, so I figured it was worth covering. So first, I'm going to start with a PCR refresher for you all because it was helpful for me too, um, to just kind of understand where do cycle threshold values come from. And it starts with PCR, which is polymerase chain reaction. This is our gold standard molecular test, the bulk of what we do for diagnostic testing for COVID. And essentially the way it works is you're, if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, because if you think about collecting a sample, say a nasopharyngeal swab or a nasal swab from someone, you've got a lot in that sample. You have mucus, you have normal flora of bacteria and viruses, you have human DNA, and you're looking for that needle in a haystack, which is the nucleic acid that is specific to SARS-CoV-2. That's what you're looking for to see if this person has the virus and is infected. And so the best way we've come up with in science land is to really, if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, make a bunch of copies of the needle and then it's much easier to find. So that's how PCR works. You essentially focus on a specific target that is very specific to COVID-19, SARS-CoV virus, a range of nucleic acids in a certain order, and you essentially try to replicate it if it's there. And you do that by going through a series of kind of melting um, apart double-stranded DNA, and then like a zipper kind of filling it back in, and then you cool it back down. And so it goes back together, and suddenly you, instead of one copy, you now have two copies. And then you repeat that cycle over and over and over. And so you get this rapid amplification of copies if in fact that nucleic acid is present. So by the time you do your 30th cycle, you have 10 to the ninth copies if you started with one. So if you were to take that process and put it on a graph using your number of cycles on your x-axis, you would see a kind of amplification logarithmic curve if you are in fact detecting that virus nucleic acid in your sample. And the way real-time PCR works, which is kind of a type of PCR, is every time you make uh, another copy of your, of your DNA there, it emits a flash of light. There's a fluorescent probe attached, so by the time you fill it in, you zipper it back up and you have another set of double-stranded DNA, it emits light. So then if you were to graph that number of cycles and then how much light is, submitted, uh, is emitted, then you get this logarithmic curve. And that's really what we're looking for when we're doing these molecular tests. We look at these amplification plots. And so this is where cycle thresholds come in because it's a threshold or a cutoff value that if your curve goes above that cutoff, then you're calling that real. Um, it, it exceeds your threshold, your background noise, and you're calling that, yep, that's enough amplification for me to be sure that that nucleic acid is present in my sample and it's not just background noise, that you're truly getting amplification and replication of your needle in your haystack. So that's your CT value. It's the number of cycles it takes to exceed that threshold. And so you can imagine it's somewhat quantitative in that if you have more virus to begin with, it doesn't take as many cycles to amplify it up and cross that threshold. Whereas if you only have one copy of the, the virus and its nucleic acid, it, you're gonna have to go through that cycle many more times to get enough amplification for you to exceed that cutoff value. So that's your CT value. It's the number of cycles it takes to cross that threshold. So this is what it looks like in the lab because we don't just do one sample at a time. And it looks like this. This is our kind of standard amplification plot. You can see that threshold shown in blue at set at 0.2. And you can see the number of cycles on the bottom in the x-axis. And what you can see is from that first red line, that has a CT value of 22 in that it took 22 cycles to get it to cross that threshold. And that would imply that there's a lot of virus in your sample. So it's kind of counterintuitive that the lower your CT value, the higher the amount of virus you have from the beginning. And I know that always trips me up and a lot of other people. So it kind of helps to walk yourself through the graph. If you look at the green line, that would have a cycle, value, cycle threshold value of 30 in that it takes 30 cycles for it to amplify enough to cross that threshold. So that would have less starting virus than the red line. And then if you look at the light blue line, that took 36 cycles for it to amplify enough to cross the threshold. So that would have even less virus than say the red or the green. And then finally, and thankfully, because not everything amplifies and is positive, this is what a negative result would look like, is you might have some squiggly background stuff, but it wouldn't even come close to creating that clean logarithmic line and crossing that threshold. So it's a pretty quick and clear way for the laboratorians to see which samples are positive and which ones are negative. 
So you're probably asking yourself, why don't we publish this? This seems like really helpful information. Well, there's a couple reasons, but most simple is we can't. Um, due to the emergency use authorization, which is what FDA uses for diagnostic tests for COVID, um, it limits it to the qualitative detection of nucleic acid from SARS-CoV, and that's different from quantitative detection. If we were to publish the CT value, that would be somewhat of an indicator of how much virus in your sample, and that's when we start to toe that line of quantitative. And so, first and foremost, we're limited by just giving a qualitative answer of positive or negative because FDA limits it through the EUA. But more perhaps importantly uh, is that you can't necessarily compare all CT values to each other. It's kind of an apples and oranges situation in that there's no standard. The CT cutoffs, those thresholds, are determined by the manufacturer of the test, not the state or the laboratory performing the test, which means test manufacturer A may set a threshold at one point and then test manufacturer B could set it at another. And so then if you're comparing the CT values between those two tests, you're not comparing the same things against each other. So as I was alluding to, not all tests use those same cutoff values. So if you get a CT value of 36 using test one, that could be interpreted as positive. Test two would be negative, and even test three could call that indeterminate. So a CT value in isolation is not all that informative or helpful, certainly from a clinical perspective. And then to add another layer of complexity is not all tests use the same gene targets to amplify. So going back to that original PCR slide, you're targeting a very specific section of the genome of the virus, those nucleic acids. And while most test manufacturers for COVID use roughly the same genes, we're looking at nucleocapsid and spike and envelope genes, not all tests use the same target sequences. And so the amplification you're looking at is derived from a different target depending on the test. And so for example, test one, you may have to see amplification in an internal control as well as a nucleocapsid gene for a sample to be called positive, whereas test two, you might need to amplify the spike gene as well as the envelope gene in addition to a control to be able to call that positive. And even more complicated, some tests don't require the control to work as long as you get enough amplification of these other genes that are so specific to SARS-CoV-2 that if you're seeing amplification there, you can be sure that that's a SARS-CoV-2 positive. So you can see here, not only are the cutoffs different, the tests target different genes, to produce those CT values, and you need different combinations of those to ultimately arrive at a positive or negative result. So just to give you an example of this in real life, here at the Tennessee Public Health Lab, we use three main molecular platforms for COVID-19, our Cepheid Expert, Hologic Panther, and Thermo Fisher TACPAC. And if you look at the next column, they use a different combination of gene targets. And if you look at the next column, they use a different number of cycle numbers to um, determine whether or not a sample is positive or negative. Also, some assays don't even use cycle numbers or produce cycle thresholds. They actually compare to relative number of units of light emitted kind of signal to background. There's lots of different ways you can calculate this. So you don't always get a CT value from a molecular test. So the result can be reported even to the laboratory in a different form. You don't always get a CT value. Only one of our three main platforms gives us a CT value in the laboratory. But because of that EUA, we're limited and everything we report out is going to be qualitative, positive, negative, indeterminate, et cetera. So after all this, what does a CT value tell you? Why are we talking about it? Well, it is an indicator of roughly how much virus is in a sample and that the lower your CT value, the more virus you have, and the higher the CT value, the less virus you have. You have to go through more cycles of amplification to reach that cutoff. And it's also potentially an indicator of the viral load over the course of infection. We certainly use viral load with other pathogens, things like hepatitis and HIV, but that's because things are a lot more standardized. There's calibrations to known concentration, so you can use a viral load to indicate where someone is in their infection, whether or not treatment is working, or if they're failing treatment, if they're developing resistance. You can use viral load um, with other pathogens. But we are not there yet with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I get uncomfortable even saying <laughs> these things because we just don't know enough yet. And there's a lot of factors that are kind of external to the laboratory. These are all the things I care about. but. CT value can change based on the sample type you're collecting, whether it's a nasal swab or a BAL. 
certainly how much specimen is collected, how much virus you have at the starting point certainly impacts your CT value. And also the stage of infection. We know people tend to have less virus in the beginning and the very end, and you get a kind of a curve throughout. And so depending on when you're sampling the person, your CT value can vary over the course of their infection. Um, CT value can also uh, be impacted by even more external factors, transit time, how many times you freeze and thaw your sample. There's so many things that can impact the CT value. At this point, with our current knowledge, it's just not a useful number in isolation to be helpful for treating a patient clinically or to be using for like contact tracing. So what does a CT value tell you in light of SARS-CoV-2? Well, not much for right now. We're still learning. There's a lot of ongoing studies um, talking and trying to evaluate how CT values change over time when people go through SARS-CoV-2 infection. But for right now, because there's not any standardization between the tests and because the EUA doesn't allow it, and because it's really not an indicator of infectiousness, because it's, about, it's amplifying nucleic acid, which is a component, but not an entire live transmissible virus. And so someone can be PCR positive because you're detecting just pieces of DNA for longer periods of time, far past the window where they might actually be infectious. And so you're still going to get a CT value from that, even if you're detecting dead virus, and they're still going to be considered SARS-CoV-2 positive, but they're not necessarily infectious. And so from public health, we're trying to hone that in and figure out, okay, is there a CT value where you can be confident that someone is infectious or past a point where it's high enough that, you know, they may be SARS-CoV positive but not likely to transmit. So we're still figuring that out. Um, so it's not a helpful metric right now. So all this to say, act on the result that's reported, whether it's positive or negative. And if you have any questions about the interpretation, please always ask the lab. We're happy to work with you through it, retest things if need be. Um, you can always send lab, uh, samples to the lab for confirmation at the public health lab. And if things just don't match clinically with what you're seeing on the lab report, when in doubt, talk to the lab. We're happy to help. And that's it for me. That's kind of our mantra, when in, when in doubt, talk to the lab. Yes, because, we don't bite. Uh, We're yeah, nice. You, you guys always uh, know. Uh, what to, what to do and how to talk sense into into us when we're a little bit confused. So that was not nearly as painful as I thought it was going to be. Good. So um, that you know because I I told you I was looking at those slides about 11 o'clock last night and my eyes sort of crossed. But um, thank you for explaining all that. So why why the sudden interest from the media in all of this? Well, there have been some very vocal scientists and others um, that are talking about certainly you know, more point of care testing, testing more frequently with tests that are perhaps less accurate than your standalone PCR, but saying among the PCR samples that we're doing and testing, you know, CT values can be semi-quantitative. So they could be an indicator of where someone's at in their infection, how transmissible they are. I'm using air quotes, you can't see me, but false positives, that's what they're calling false positives, that they would still be detectable, but not transmissible. And so, Certainly the precedent has been set with other pathogens. That, that's a very real possibility. We're just not at the point with SARS-CoV-2 and our understanding of the etiology and the course of infection to really be able to kind of link those and say, if the CT value is this, it means this. And also there's not enough standardization between all the diagnostic tests to really be able to compare them to each other. So you can imagine if you get a CT value and you're not going to because of the EUA, but if it was done by on a certain, you would have to know what test performed it and also what laboratory. And also a lot of labs employ multiple test platforms. So having that number in isolation really isn't going to be informative at this point in time. That makes sense. All right. Well, why don't we start with your questions while we're kind of on the lab roll right now. So with the variations between PCR tests, are all of them equally sensitive? Oh, can you scroll down? <laughs> Sorry. And specific. Um, I mean, there's going to be variations between all the tests because they do target different parts of the, the viral genome, but in general, PCR is very sensitive and specific. So compared to, say, antigen tests or other kinds of tests out there, th th those are the main two really for diagnostic tests, um, I would say they're all very specific and very sensitive. So there might be some small variations between them, but largely they are pretty sensitive and specific. Right. And are these instant tests of any real value? I guess they're talking about maybe the Binax now test yeah. that in the media. If you have to confirm it anyway, are we sure you are only infectious when symptomatic? Wouldn't that interfere with these tests? 
So I do think there is a role and a value to these, what I'm guessing are antigen tests, kind of these instant rapid tests uh, that you can use in a point of care setting. Certainly if it's positive, it indicates that it's detecting viral antigens, which means it's in the person and they're potentially infectious. And so that's actionable data. You can isolate someone, you can start your contact tracing, you can treat them. Uh, so there is value, especially if it's positive. I think the challenge is interpretation of the negative and whether or not you need to confirm. And that really is going to vary based on what test you're using, the population you're testing it in, whether or not you're doing diagnostic testing or just like weekly screening of staff in your facility. Um, it's going to depend on the prevalence in your population, last time you had a positive in, say, your facility. So all those factors go into whether or not you need to confirm, say, a negative rapid test result with a more sensitive PCR test. Um, and CDC does have guidance for antigen testing that kind of spell that out for the different types of testing you do. Um, we are fairly sure that you can be infectious when you're not symptomatic. Um, we have definitely seen documentation of transmission through asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic individuals. So yeah, that is a challenge and even more challenging is the intended use for a lot of these antigen tests are for people who are symptomatic. But we know they're not always being used in that setting, that they are using it as a screening tool for people who aren't symptomatic but are at risk or potentially exposed. And so that's kind of what folks are grappling with now is, is what do these results mean in that light? It's pretty clear if someone's symptomatic how you should use it, but if they're not, we're still figuring that out. And as more of these tests are deployed and kind of put into real life use, I think that data is going to come. So I'm optimistic, but we don't have the answers yet. Yeah, the other the other variable is is just the user end of it too, because you know I know initially the the data that was being sent out from Abbott about the Binax Now test was oh they're you know, super sensitive and specific, um, and yeah in a lab where you know exactly what you're doing and and the the specimens that you're testing, mm -hmm. um, but in a, on a countertop, especially a test like the Binax Now, which is just a card mm -hmm. and a swab, if there is virus in the mm -hmm. environment, if the person who's doing the test is infected, if there can be yeah. a lot of reasons to get false positives um, or to, to get a poor swab and get a false negative. Yep, so that's a very real risk and one we've seen if like the same person is doing the testing and the collecting, that suddenly you can get a whole bunch of antigen positives, but if you retest them, they're PCR negative, so they're grappling with that. Yeah, so lots of challenges and, and uh, you know, every, just like the vaccines, every test has a downside. Uh, sure. you, you sacrifice sensitivity and specificity and, and reliability, positive predictive value, um, the faster your test gets mm -hmm. um, and the, the more precise the test is, the longer it sometimes takes to, to get it back, so it's always a trade. Um, uh, okay, so let me go to how is the replication defective vector vaccine protected against mutation into a virulent strain? It seems that duplicating a virus to infect host cells might also provide the opportunity for the virus to mutate. So that's a really good thought. Um, so they have actually been using replication de defective vector um, technology for a really long time. Um, there, it's mostly in veterinary medicine with um, vaccines against certain pathogens that are in that world, but it's, it's certainly applicable to human vaccines. It's also the kind of technology that's used for gene therapy, which um, is, and so there, I'm, I'm not a, a, a researcher and I, I don't play with the creation of vaccines. Um, but it's technology that they're, that they're comfortable with, that they've used in lots of different types of applications. Um, they also usually use viruses that are pretty innocuous. So, you know, if you were to get a mutated adenovirus, um, you know, it probably wouldn't be um, lethal in, in most cases, even if, uh, if, even if it was able to, to mutate and replicate. But I think the, the technology is pretty solid there uh, where they're not concerned about that. Um, who decide? the order in which the vaccine will be distributed, local or federal. So um, all of that lies with the state um, 
And uh, the, the federal government puts out guidelines. For example, the suggestion is that the very first um, priority for vaccination would be frontline healthcare workers. Um, states can choose to follow those guidelines or choose not to follow those guidelines. And then there has to be a lot of sub-prioritization of these populations because we know, for example, that we won't get enough vaccine all at once in the beginning to vaccinate every frontline healthcare worker. So we have to determine how to subdivide those populations to prior, sub-prioritize populations within those healthcare providers. So for example, maybe people who have certain high-risk health conditions who are, high, who are um, frontline healthcare workers or um, people who meet certain age um, cutoffs would be prioritized over people who don't. Um, and then the, the other important thing is, is the definition of a healthcare worker. So uh, in our thinking, that includes people who would have any kind of contact with any potentially infectious patient or a byproduct of an infectious patient. So like that's- your friendly laboratorian. That's friendly laboratorians, it's, it's pharmacists, yep. it's people who clean the rooms, and people who turn over the ORs, it's um, people who deliver the meals. Uh, it's, it's all of those people and, and you know, the argument also that people who are unlicensed people working in healthcare are probably some of the most vulnerable um, populations. And so uh, all of those decisions are being made and vetted through that large stakeholder group um, and then we'll be submitting that plan um, by next Friday to CDC and then we'll be able to, um, to, be able to share some details of that. Um, Someone's asking what's the cause of the uptick in cases? Is it school opening or less use of public health measures? Uh, so probably yes. Um, you know, there is definitely fatigue in the community. Um, you know, we're we're tired of fighting it. Uh, everyone else is tired of having to wear masks and socially distance and uh, not seeing grandma and grandpa and all of the things that um, that are just emotionally difficult. Um, and so with that fatigue has come a lot of opposition to um, those public health measures that we know work. And so we're seeing mask mandates that had been set by county mayors fall off the books now. We're seeing schools um, decide to ignore the public health recommendations around quarantining and isolating students. Um, and, uh, and there's been some pretty heavy pushback about um, quarantining contacts and isolating people who are infectious. And so um, public health is not only fighting the virus and the pandemic, but we're also um, trying to mitigate um, some public kind of turning on, um, on public health and the recommendations that we and the CDC um, have made around trying to contain the virus. So uh, I think as we start to see all of those measures slide as people get tired of it and also as we come into illness season and then the holidays where people are going to be gathering and traveling, we're going to see some continued uptick in those numbers. Um, also, are we putting too much hope in vaccines when 50% of people aren't going to avail themselves of the vaccine or we don't know if the antibodies are protective? Um, <laughs> so, uh, and there's, uh, we're told that there are lots of variations on this question that have come up into the, to, to the Q&A. So I'll address the antibody part first. So, um, all of the vaccines that are currently in phase three clinical trials are showing really robust antibody production. And the question that remains is how long does it last? So um, that's where the, the longevity of those studies becomes really, really important. Even if we could get a vaccine that only conferred short-term immunity, maybe six months or 12 months, it would still give us the opportunity to stop transmission of this virus in our communities and would still be worth having um, even if it was going to be a, a short-acting protection to at least be able to stop this constant cycle of people getting infected. Um, and then there's been varying studies or, or surveys around public uptake of vaccines. I think there needs to be a, a huge um, public information campaign to explain the development of the vaccines and exactly what I said to you at the, at the top of the hour about you know the the Clinical trials are not rushed. They are not warp speed. Um, it is the, the manufacturing part of this that is, that is faster. And so typically these companies are trying to find capital and investors 
to be able to market a vaccine that um, may or may not prove profitable. And there's, there's not a lot of money to be gained in producing vaccines, which is why we have so many vaccines that only have one manufacturer. Um, so when that's taken out of the mix, we don't have to wait two or five or 10 years to be able to produce a vaccine because there's funding available to do it. And that's what Operation Warp Speed, we can argue about the, the um, helpfulness of that name, um, has done to, to try to prime the pump to get vaccine out faster. Um, we're also hoping that as more data come available and more people do get the vaccine, that those maybe 50% of folks who um, are, are not confident at this point will come around over time uh, when we know more. Um, does the uptick in number of cases appear to be due to increases in transmission or more availability of testing? So the testing numbers across the state have remained pretty stable uh, over the past several months. So we're not seeing um, big increases in testing. Actually, we're seeing some declines in testing at this point. So um, there's some reluctance for people to get tested. Um, because if you're an athlete or you're um, uh, in a fraternity, you might not want to be the person that ends up getting your team quarantined or your fraternity quarantined. And so now we have people who um, probably are infectious that are not getting tested and identified because of that reluctance. So um, it's not because of more testing. It's because there, there are more cases. And, um, and also earlier I showed you the, the test positivity rate. So that's at 6.8% now. It was down to something like 5.3% a few weeks ago. We've been as high as 10, 11%. Um, but that test positivity rate is still high, and that's um, rather than looking at just pure numbers of tests that are conducted, you really need to look at that positivity rate. When positivity rates are very high and testing numbers are very low, it means we're only testing really sick people, probably in hospitals, and we don't want that. Um, but we also want to make sure that, um, that we're not doing um, tons of testing where, um, where it's inappropriate and where it's you know, lots and lots of asymptomatic people. That can also drive the numbers artificially down as far as test positive rates. Um, and then I think last question, are schools running their own contact tracing or is it in conjunction with the health departments? The news seems to be contradictory. So it is the responsibility of the health department to do contact tracing. What we have asked for is collaboration with school districts because so often it's the school districts that find out first about a positive test and there may be some lag by the time that lab actually gets reported to the state and then our process happens to reach out to that person and do contact tracing. So if parents call the school and notify them that their child is positive, then what we hope is that the school will turn around and notify the health department that they know of this positive and that they will also assist in contact tracing within the school because no interview with a case is going to tell us um, who a kindergartner was sitting next to in class. And in order to get that information, we need to know what seating charts look like in those schools, or we need to know about the bus that they ride and who else was on the bus and who they sit next to on the bus or who they eat lunch with. And a lot of that information um, can't be gleaned without the assistance of, um, of the schools as well. So we really hope that um, all the schools will continue to partner with their local departments of health and that they will also um, help us in identifying those close contacts so that those people can be appropriately quarantined and stop transmission of the virus within the schools. Initially, we were really only seeing kids that were positive in schools because they were contracting the virus outside of school um, because they were going to sleepovers or um, it was through sports. Um, now we're seeing schools that have active transmission inside the schools, and that's because um, those close contacts are not being quarantined to uh, make sure that they're not going to be spreading that virus within the school during that 14-day period where they can become infectious. So um, we really appreciate all of the help that the, that the schools are doing. Um, it is a massive undertaking for the schools as well as for the health departments and um, really we all do better if it's all hands on deck. So with that, um, we would love for you to put in ideas about um, discussions for next time. 
and we will plan to meet again in two weeks, which will be Friday, October the 23rd at noon central, 1 Eastern, and we hope you'll come back and listen more then. Thanks, everyone. Have, Thank a, have a good weekend. Bye.